Welcome back to the Surrey Watch Guy, everyone. I'm Dan. Today is an amazing day. I've come into life-changing money. I mean serious money. I mean, no, wait a minute. No, I haven't. I was dreaming. Oh, well. We all dream about making it rich, don't we? Be it we invent something that just literally changes the world and we become an overnight billionaire or some long-lost uncle leaves us something in our will that we didn't know about or there's the lottery win which you know some people do win i mean when you get this suddenly all these grail watches that you only ever dreamed of they're suddenly reality with this kind of money one can choose to be as cavalier as they like the things that actually matter to us when we're choosing watches suddenly aren't that relevant anymore be it buyer's remorse the watch tanks in value or there's some feature which annoys you a little bit which would make you sell it now it doesn't matter you'll just keep it anyway it would be all too easy and a little bit pedestrian of me to do a short blurb and then present the Rolex Daytona 116508, the Patek Philippe Nautilus 5711, the Audemars Piquet Royal Oak 15450 ST blah blah. No thanks. I've always been of the idea that if it's my money, therefore I should buy what I like, not what hype says I should buy. Be it normal life or this fantasy shopping list. It amuses me no end the amount of people asking for other people online to justify their buying decisions. I mean, for fuck's sake, a topic for another video sometime maybe. I make no apologies for some of the watches that you'll be seeing henceforth. My taste is my taste, or lack thereof, should we say. First up is a Richard Mille Blue Sapphire RM56 Custom. <laughs> yeah, right, no way. Even if I could afford this, I couldn't buy it as Jay-Z has the only one that's ever been made. Anyway, it's so bloody ugly. Look at it. it looks like a jelly bean has swallowed a transformer. However, one has to admire the sheer fuck you of it. Sapphire is an absolute shit machine and it took 3,000 hours apparently just to make the case alone. Anyway, enough of this. Jokes aside, here are the watches that I would actually buy. First up is the Panerai Submersible Verde Militare. It's such a cool looking piece. It ticks all the military boxes. The green dial is a classic army green tone and coupled with the all brushed steel case with giant crown protector, small seconds hand and a concertina rubber strap. It's a solid choice for those diving holidays in Bora Bora that I would certainly have to have planned with my millions. Next up is a Blancpain 50 Fathoms Bathyscaphe limited edition for Houdinki. The 100 pieces of this limited edition run sold out in minutes when it went live on their website and for good reason. A stunner of a vintage watch but made to modern specifications and with a superb satin brush 38mm case. A matte ceramic bezel with liquid metal diving scale looks stunning and the large dial numerals aid legibility. Throw in a 100 hour power reserve and it's take my money! Next up is the Tudor Black Bay 58 incredible bang for buck housing what many may say would be the perfect case size for a watch at 39 mil this watch has the wearing charm of a vintage rolex submariner with the looks reminiscent of the old big crown the gilt details on the hands indices and bezel are as subtle as they are delightful a 70 hour power reserve is the icing on a cake the faux riveted bracelet is a little me but this watch would be a nato queen anyway Next up is the H Moser & C Swiss Alp watch. I mean, yeah, I know, look at it. It's very much like the Apple watch, but wow, have Moser made it cooler. The dial is made of a material called Vanta Black, which is the darkest man-made material ever made that captures up to 99.965% of light photons, making the dial look, in essence, like a black hole. The hands are also colored black, but against the dial appear lighter and they look like they're actually floating in space. The really cool thing is the running seconds, which are shown as the loading style symbol at the six o'clock position. It's a really fun and amusing piece, but finished to an incredible high quality. Just look at that movement. Oh, and it's got a 100 hour power reserve again. What a bonus. Next up is the Hamilton Khaki Field. A super little beta watch, this one. The only reason I haven't bought one is that I picked up the Smith's Everest recently. However, I really would get one of these. 24 hour timekeeping, kept super simple. The radium colored super luminova on the hour indices are a nice touch and break up the monochrome look. 
The PVD coating on the case will most likely scratch up over probably a very short time, but it will certainly add to the overall character of the watch. The hand-wound movement allows for some personal interaction with the watch, but only every 80 hours, so it won't become a tiresome bore, hopefully. Next up is the Bell & Ross BR05 Skeleton Blue. I guess I'm going to get totally flamed for this, but I love this watch. Brushed steel case, integrated bracelet, the case is super slim, it's blue. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? Yeah, I know it. It looks like a rip-off of a Royal Oak or a Nautilus, or like they've actually had sex and made a hybrid. But I actually really like the look of this one a lot. The grey skeletonized movement looks great under the blue sapphire crystal. The industrial design is subtle and finished nicely for the price. I love the lack of date complication too. It's a lot of money for a watch with a Solita movement, but this is a money bag list after all, eh? Next up is the R. Langer & Sona Saxonia Automatic. Any money, no object watch collection needs a Langer. I've always preferred their more simple designs and this one is my favourite of the lot. A white gold case with a solid silver dial that's coloured a deep blue. It's stunning. The small seconds at 6 o'clock add some interest and use up some of the available dial space and it adds a great visual balance. With a 38.5mm case size and being only 7.8mm thick, it would be an absolute joy to wear. If you flip the watch over, your eyes are treated to one of the most incredibly hand-finished movements ever. All for the grey market price of a stainless steel Daytona. I know which watch I would rather have. Next up is an Amiga Planet Ocean. Now, as you've probably seen, I did own an Amiga Planet Ocean Liquid Metal Limited Edition. It's now recently gone to a new home, so I'd have to replace it, and this is the one I'd replace it with. Black and gold always go well together, and the red gold case of this Amiga, coupled with the dark lustrous ceramic bezel with Serra Gold Diving Scale, just ooze luxury. Gold dive watches are pretty pointless, but wow, this watch is great. I change out that horrible leather strap for an Amiga OEM black rubber and cue the perfect chunky gold over-engineered dressy diver. Next up is a Rolex Submariner. No surprises, of course there's going to be one in the collection. This is probably the most famous reference of the most famous dive watch in history. This is the Mill Sub, built off the back of the already superb reference 5513. The British Ministry of Defence requested Rolex made a few adjustments to make it to their military specifications. The T-stamped dial, gladiator-style sword hands and fully graduated bezel, coupled with fixed spring bars, no bracelet ear mate, NATO only, and knowing only 1,200 were issued to some of the finest fighting soldiers in the world, you know this watch has seen it all and has survived to tell the tale. This is a must-have. Next up is the Vacheron Constantin Historiques American 1921. Move over Daytona. I hate chronographs anyway. What can I say? Hate me. <laughs> but this is the driving watch in my opinion. With that gorgeous cushion shaped case that is so well finished that the gold has the smoothness of, well, butter. I mean, just look at it, will you? Then there's that crisp white diagonal dial with large black Arabic numerals and the small seconds. Throw in the crown between the one and three o'clock and you have a watch that's almost as cool as a Corvette Stingray, which naturally I'd just have to pick one of these up too. I'll probably get a lot of hate for this one as well, but whatever, it's my choice. This is an Amiga Ploprof, over-engineered to the point of being ridiculous and with a face that only a mother could love. The Ploprof can be a difficult watch to understand, but when you finally get it, you get it. I'm not a fan of the current model, but the reference from the early 1970s makes for a super vintage dive watch. Just throw it on an isoframe rubber strap and boom, job done. Next up is the Rolex Day Date. Now, if it wasn't for the dome smooth bezel, this would be a platinum Day Date being spoken about here, as I absolutely love the ice blue dial not to mention the luster that only platinum has, but a fluted bezel is a must for a day date in my opinion. Being a fan of white metals anyway, this watch is perfection. Subtle yet striking in equal measure, the olive green dial is absolutely gorgeous and has a nice pop against the metal. The feel of the President bracelet 
is also something that has to be experienced to be believed. I love this watch and I would definitely add it to the collection. Next up is a Doxa Sub 200 Diving Star. I mean, this watch is sunshine on the wrist, right? This would be great for a dull winter or a hot summer's day. I love yellow as a colour and the colour alone makes it such a fun watch. In black, I wouldn't even give this watch a second glance. I wish it didn't have the date because that's the one thing that just ruins the dial. But secondly, this is a fun watch. So why would you need a date on it when you're having fun? Last up is a Rolex Oyster Perpetual. I've been wanting to pick up this watch since October 2020, which was before the hype really bit with these watches. Currently, these are a super hot commodity, which makes the likelihood of me getting the call pretty damn slim. I love the turquoise dial as it sets it apart from other watches. Being a no date is a design preference for me. A great watch and particularly for the warmer months. Stop. As a side note, I'd also pick up the yellow, green and coral red dial options just because they're so damn sexy. You were probably expecting something super expensive in platinum costing north of 200 grand for the last watch, but everyone who knows me is aware of how much I'm in love with the turquoise Oyster Perpetual. It's pretty much the perfect watch for me. I will have to go into it in more detail in a future video sometime. So that's my fantasy watch collection, all £324,000 worth. A lot of money, absolutely. And in honesty, I'd be absolutely happy with even one of those watches. What do you think? Which watches would you buy? Let me know in the comments below. I'd really love to have a discussion about it. If you like this video, give it a like. If you'd like to see future videos, click the subscribe button, but don't forget to hit the bell icon. Then you'll get notifications when I drop a new video. Talking of future videos, I will be dropping a video pretty soon of the uh, Smith's Everest. It's going to be a review after a month's wear and I've pretty much worn it every day so look out for that one. I'm also over on Instagram at the Surrey Watch Guy so give me a follow. Thanks, see you next time.